Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is William Rowell. I will be uh, moderating uh, this evening's State of Black of Annapolis. I um, wanted to preface our uh, today's session, uh, which is the third session, um, with speaking to how important it is, not just during uh, Black History Month, uh, to chronicle and also take note of issues that are facing uh, African Americans um, in the city of Annapolis, but to also take this opportunity to encourage us to have ongoing conversations um, where we can have these kinds of discussions, but also broaden the scope of the subject matter. So I want to first of all acknowledge you all who are here, um, a lot of familiar faces whom I've seen at other um, sessions that we had on this subject, but also for us to begin to uh, dialogue further. So tonight, what we will be doing is talking about the future, and this is part three of the State of Black of Annapolis conversations. Um, the State of Black Annapolis, um, as a vehicle to have these conversations, remains uh, one of the most um, important, I believe, forms for thought leadership around racial equality in Annapolis, uh, across economics, employment, education, health, housing, criminal justice, and what I believe is somewhat the overarching umbrella, which is civic participation. And, you know, we, We've had a lot of conversations um, uh, about each of these areas, but I believe the common thread is civic participation because, again, it's, it, it can be like a tree falling in the forest, right? It doesn't make a sound. And so in order for us to actually uh, embody what we speak of, which is having conversations and being able to eventually come up with some solutions and a strategy and a roadmap to improve the quality of lives of black people in the city of Annapolis, we do need to ensure that we are including all in this conversation. So um, I want to uh, extend my appreciation for those of us who are here and encourage as we continue to have these types of conversations that we bring others into the fold so that we can share this information. Again, uh, the subject matters um, for tonight uh, center around the future. And we'll be talking about economics, education, elections, and entertainment, um, all beginning with E, but all definitely firmly centered in the alphabet, right? <laughs> because um, all of those letters are important. So each of these sessions has contained uh, pertinent and, I believe, penetrating commentary and insightful analysis from recognized people in our community. Uh, so we've had educators, um, we've had people who, who uh, work in the area of business, and we've also had people uh, who are in the area of uh, uh, faith leadership, um, and then we've also had people who, who, who work in government, who understand a bit of how the operation works from the other side, but remembering that that only exists, again, because of our civic duty and because of that concentric circle of, of civic participation. So we want to begin tonight by first checking in with our panelists, and I will name our panelists, and then our panelists um, will introduce themselves after I give a brief uh, biography of who they are as an introduction. So tonight we will have Michelle Coates, 
who will be speaking with us um, about economics, around the area of economics. We will also have Stacy King, uh, who will be speaking with us uh, around the area of education. And we will have um, our youngest alderman um, in the history of the city of Annapolis, um, Alderman Dewan Gay, who will be speaking about elections and looking at it through that lens. And we will also have, rounding out our panel, Marcus Hayes, who will be speaking with us about entertainment and the area of entertainment. Um, before I begin, I want to also acknowledge um, our elected officials that are in the room. We have um, Delegate Shanika Henson. I tried to wait for one second so you could get your coat off. <laughs> and I could go on and on about um, our our esteemed representative um, who, has, who has done and continues to do amazing things and be a voice for you know, a lot of our issues at the community level, but also at the state level. Um, so, so thank you very much for being in attendance tonight. Um, and I also want to recognize Alderwoman Rhonda Pendel Charles, uh, who, who always shows up and is always there and a strong advocate for not just the subject matter that we're talking about in the state of Black Annapolis, but all other things. And then we have um, someone who um, actually has enabled us at the city level to really have a lot of these conversations. And, and not just conversations, but to actually put those conversations and the ideology of it into works. Um, and, and that is our mayor, uh, Mayor Gavin Buckley. And, before I begin, I want to acknowledge um, uh, Anatola Ajayi as a staff person in the mayor's office, but, but you know, also someone who has who has uh, who has and continues to work tirelessly to create um, a a way for us to not only have these conversations but to institutionalize them in a way where we have programmatic models to actually work in communities, but also deal with some of our tough, you know, our toughest societal issues, such as opioids, uh, addiction, or substance abuse uh, prevention, also violence prevention, and also in the world of, of what we call technology, smart technology, as well as entrepreneurship. So thank you so much, Tola. And I'm sure you all know. Um, and, uh, we have um, a few other people as we go throughout the program in lieu of time, I will introduce, we have some, uh, we have a new staff person um, who's doing some, some very meaningful work that I wanna also acknowledge, but I'll, I'll take the, you know, the perfect time to do that. And again, my name is William Rowell, um, and, and I also work in the mayor's office. So, we wanna begin. Thank you. So uh, we want to begin tonight by, by having a welcome and some words from our mayor. Um, so Mayor Gavin Buckley, um, please come forward. And uh... Uh, Well, um, it's exciting to be here. Um, <coughs> I want to just point out uh, how lucky we are uh, to have this amazing library in the city of Annapolis. What a great asset. Um, I really uh, love the fact that I thought, you know, libraries might be dead with, with technology, and, uh, but they're so important in this day and age for placemaking, and I think this city is blessed to have such an amazing facility. I know our state representatives, our county representatives made sure this happened, and uh, we, I want to just put my hands together for all your efforts to make this thing happen. Um, uh, so uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit briefly about the future of Annapolis, uh, uh, the future uh, which I believe is bright. Um, uh, I believe um, uh, some of our history uh, in the African American community has not been uh, prioritized in this city. Um, uh, and we have such great, rich, rich history. Um, I know. Uh, and I can just speak to my own experience as a business owner um, on West Street um, when I set up shop um, at Tsunami and, and, and realized that um, just a stone's throw away from Tsunami, 
uh, some of the greats in music used to have to stay in their black accommodations at segregated hotels there. But the fact that Sarah Vaughan and Count Basie, Duke Ellington, such great people like that, um, used to come to this city and play, and, and that we had this amazing, rich, rich uh, music history for, for decades. And, and I thought, if that was something in any other city in America or any other city in the world, they would celebrate it so much. And um, it really wasn't, you know, I think, getting the attention that it deserved. <coughs> I believe uh, we've drawn attention to that. Uh, we're working with the state now uh, to save uh, uh, one piece of a parcel of land that was sparrows, cars, and Elktonia. We feel very uh, good about the potential of saving uh, this piece of property uh, and potentially getting it a national designation as a, 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 an important site in the, in the country uh, and creating a beautiful heritage park. And that, if any of you are not familiar with the area, is over off of Forest Drive, Edgewood Road. Um, it was a place where everybody came and played and um, it was on the Chitlin circuit. Um, I love the fact that we have this kind of rich history in this town. I love to tie it back to St. John's College where two white boys uh, went on and started two record labels, uh, 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 Electra Records and Atlantic Records. Um, uh, and we know that they were influenced by the music at Cars Beach. Uh, we know uh, they were influenced by WANN, the African American radio station in this uh, city that was one of the largest, second largest listenership in the country. We know that the Smithsonian has recognized that history. So we have just a, that little piece of history um, is uh, so amazing. Uh, to this city, but there's so, so much more. And um, I've made sure that our future uh, recognizes that. Um, I'm making sure uh, with the decisions that we make as a city and a city council, that we um, acknowledge the contribution of the African American community to the foundation of this city. Uh, whether it's from uh, Kunta Kinti to, 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 to the music history, to to uh, Thorogood Marshall, to Banneker Douglas, so those sorts of things that have touched this city, uh, we are so privileged to sort of ha can say that that is part of our DNA. And so uh, a as a guy who's come from another country and doesn't really know this stuff, is learning this stuff, is being taught this stuff by the people in this room and the people that are watching tonight, um, I want to thank you for helping me grow uh, and helping me make this city, I believe, a, a better place. Uh, we have been intentional on how we have governed in the last four, four years. We've made sure that this city, that the executives in this city and the employees of this city and, and, and the people that we involve in this city look like the actual residents of this city. Um, and so you will see that in, um, uh, in our, in a, in our uh, 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 director of planning uh, uh, public works, our, 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 our city attorney, di different people, executives in this city who the kids can look to and say, that could be me. I could be that guy making, you know, 180,000 a year. We've been making sure that when we bring interns into the city, that they look around and they see people and they see the future uh, for themselves. Um, uh, I am going to continue to make sure that that we prioritise that, that we're intentional um, in how this city grows. Um, we want to be a leader. Um, and um, we are going to make sure that our city dock project, um, the project that we're about to do, the reimagined city dock, uh, is going to um, obviously uh, recognize the contributions that African Americans have made to the growth of this city. So we will make sure that we have a high profile for the Middle Passage marker that's going to be at city dock to the Alex Haley history to this city uh, and creating a space where everybody feels comfortable. And I can tell you that um, I learned as I came into the city that not everybody felt comfortable coming down to City Dock. They didn't feel like it was their place, that, uh, that everybody was welcome. We are going to make sure that we build a welcoming place, a world-class park at City Dock, a gateway park to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I love to quote... Um, um, a quote from uh, Blacks of the Chesapeake about a time in the city uh, when a, a man with a big heart and a small boat could make a living. You cannot tell downtown that there is any 
uh, workers that worked the water, crabbers, oystermen, uh, people that worked the academy, people that lived on the water when water living on the water wasn't fashionable, those families that really are the foundation of what makes this place so special. So, special. Uh, so that public space that we create will, will recognise that contribution. Um, it will be a welcoming space to everyone that comes to Annapolis. It'll be a model for the country, and it's going to be a model on innovation as well. We're going to make sure that we uh, uh, move the city forward with new ideas. Uh, one of those ideas is an electric ferry, um, a transportation plan that can get people around our city, this eight square miles, um, with a futuristic uh, an, an, a, a recognition that we have to be leaders um, on the environment. So we're moving forward on a 100% electric plan for the city. Um, it's going to go to all neighbourhoods. It's going to mobilise people from all over Annapolis, and it's going to be free. Um, there are many uh, children that are surrounded by water in this city um, that don't ever get a chance to be on the water. And I can imagine I did not grow up here. I grew up in another country, as you can tell from my accent. But I can imagine, and, and that wasn't Glen Burnie, it was just... <laughs> but I can imagine there was a time when all kids did was jump off piers and swim and crab and oyster and all those sorts of things, and we've slowly privatised our waterfront. I come from a country that doesn't let that happen. We always have public access on the waterfront. Uh, we have a multiple initiatives I could talk to you about whenever you would like to corner me on the new initiatives on waterfront access that we're doing, and they're very exciting. Um, uh, but uh, City Dock is going to be the jewel of that um, water access point. I'm looking forward to doing events with all of you um, at City Dock. Um, I'm excited about the future. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting this city. Thank you for the love that you give to it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so before we kick off, I want to also acknowledge uh, someone who preceded me uh, in front of this podium. So you all have to forgive me if I'm not uh, as exciting and, and, and colorful uh, as, the, as the previous moderator, and that's Erica Griswold. Um, and I want to thank her for her work um, for a number of different reasons. Um, but I must acknowledge her also because she also off, uh, works in our Office of, of uh, Community Services, and she's doing an amazing job working in communities and working with families and working with young people um, who need to have a voice and a connection um, to find a way to solve some of their issues, but also just, just to have someone to look up to who really cares about them. So thank you, Erica. And we also have a staff person who just recently joined, and we're all really excited about that. I'm telling you all this stuff because these are assets, but they are also people that you can reach out to for things that you need or things that you may see in our city. And his name is Richard Reynolds. And uh, he's going to be, he is our uh, lead coordinator. And it's an amazing program, which I'm sure we'll get into, and you'll hear, uh, you'll hear more about that. But it has to do with our... Um, ever-growing and evolving um, uh, connection to dealing with criminal justice issues, but also dealing with people who are returning um, you know, into society and how they're able to navigate that process. Um, along with that, we're doing um, violence interruption and um, you know, violence prevention programming along with our police department. So I think that's some amazing stuff that's happening. So thank you, Richard. Right, so let's get down to the business at hand. I, I'm going to introduce our panelists again. Um, what we will do, the format for this, so that we're all familiar with it, is our panelists are going to come and give a brief um, synopsis of their area uh, of expertise and area that they're working in uh, tonight. So our, our first person who is going to be here, um, her name is Michelle Coates. And in 2011, she was... Uh, voted the top 100 women in Maryland. Um, she also received the Fannie Lou Hamer Award. Um, 
which, which to me is incredibly important also, not that it belittles the others, but because that is um, uniquely something that came out of our community, um, along with Carl Snowden and the caucus. So uh, that's pretty exciting. In 2020, um, you were named Maryland Bankers Champion um, of Women. Thank you. And uh, for 40 years, you have been a banker and you have been a woman. <laughs> um, and Yes, and, and so we thank you for that. So Michelle Coach, you all. Good evening. First of all, thank you so much for the invitation. Tola and I owe each other favors, and every time we do one, we get one up. So I'm not sure I'll ever pay it off. So this evening, I'm here to talk about the state of the black economy, according to Michelle. And we're going to concentrate on something that I heard as a young girl from Dr. Joyce Brothers. And you got to be old to remember who she is. But I heard this a long time ago, that if you change nothing, nothing changes. And we're going to concentrate on four points. Education as the foundation for greatness. Real estate as the foundation for wealth. Laws of the land, the segregated laws in America, and the foundations for a brighter future. So most black children are born with a name, an address, and a social security number, and little else. No savings, trust fund, or college funds. Mothers and fathers have baby reveals, baby showers, and generally see just a jumpstart of basics that take them maybe three months, maybe a year. And then what? The reality of daycare, food, housing, and clothing costs set in. And the truth of our reality is many black children are born into poverty. And we know this to be true. So let's talk about the history of this struggle and what, within our power, we can do so that we can do more than survive. So let's talk about how to move forward. Education. We, the adults and parents in a child's life, should be their first teachers. We must prepare our children for school by raising them to be readers, real readers. Unless the tablet in your children's hand is teaching them to read, please replace it with a book. Many non-black children have read a thousand books before they enter kindergarten. And as a proud supporter, of the Anne Arundel County Public Library, whose name is out there many times, this library offers the same program. If you are not familiar with it, please make yourselves familiar with that. A thousand books by kindergarten. By third grade, our children are labeled as academic underachievers. By middle school, the numbers reflect children reading below grade level and are less likely to graduate from high school. These numbers are used to determine the number of prisons built, also known as the school to prison pipeline. Reading is fundamental, and teachers expect your children to show up prepared. Prepared, not to learn, but to know more than the basics. Right or wrong, that's how the classrooms are working. Children who have mastered reading at a, at a more than basic level are then invited to more advanced learning. And what type of learning do you think is going on there? Mastered readers learn things that change the conversation. Reading stories that introduce them to things that are different than what's going on in their neighborhood how to dream outside of your home, stories that teach you about money, owning homes, the stock market, and how do we begin to change that conversation? We must begin to have age-appropriate conversations with our children. Discuss your money values. Free information is available everywhere 
both Ms. Rhonda and I sit on a coalition, the Annapolis and Anne Arundel County Financial Education Coalition. We are here to do whatever type of training your organization, churches, whatever, is looking to do. Join these types of environments. You cannot be designer down and talking about rent payment. Those are the things that teach money values to your children. Normalize trade schools. Normalize trade schools. Normalize trade schools. College is not for everyone. Not all of us can afford this. Salaries for college graduates are not keeping pace with your college debt. The military is an excellent option as a career. For a young person who has not figured out what they want to do, the military offers an entry level environment for their career. Two to four years, they have gone from job to job to job trying to find their way. The military teaches discipline and skill sets. Even if it wasn't your choice, don't discourage your children's dream. I am the proud military parent of a Coast Guard kid, a Coast Guard kid who grew up three generations of water here in the city of Annapolis. He knew more about the water than several of his commanders did. And he's had the pleasure of being stationed here in Maryland. I had to remind him we have friends on the water. Be safe with them, be kind to them. But it's an option for children that have no direction, looking for other options, and need some career training. Discuss the cost of college. It's great that you've had a straight-A student that wants to go to Yale and Princeton and all of these top schools, but how are they going to pay for it, realistically? The beauty of the Anne Arundel Community College in this area, that is a national-ranked college that feeds into several nationally-ranked colleges. And for many of our children, it's free. You don't get many free opportunities. But also understand the early benefits of trade school. The technical schools here in Anne Arundel County, Cat North and Cat South, but also understand these requirements. If your child is struggling with what they like, what they do, get their interests, talk about them. A lot of our tech schools offer those services. My daughter's in the pro, and she's here, and she's going to get embarrassed, I know. But she actually went to Cat North because she had a passion for environmental science. It led her to college. We won't talk about the free scholarship that she got from her environmental skills. But there are so many options within our own school system. Know what they are as parents. If it's a niece or a nephew, share what you know with your family. There is value in hard work, and we must begin to show our children what that looks like. You can't be a senior in high school having never seen anyone in your family work hard and think that your children are going to be hard workers. It does not work that way. Let's be realistic. See, I'm not a politician. I can say these words proudly. As a banker, my contractor and construction friends and clients have been talking about the shortage of workers for years. This is not a pandemic issue. Trade schools, electricians, these apprenticeships opportunities offer six-figure salaries. So if you become an electrician or a carpenter making 100 grand, with no college debt, your lifestyle is better than your previous generation. And that's serious business. Normal, normalize words in a complimentary way. A nerd, a geek, bookworms, those should be compliments, not jokes. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, Oprah, Beyonce, all were considered nerds. 
I don't need to say anything else on that one. Real estate. Let's talk real estate. Real estate and land home ownership is how most families in this country built their wealth. The loss of black land in this city, county, and state is legendary. The system would have you believe it's your own fault, and some of it is. However, the reality, many odds were stacked against us as marginalized communities based on laws passed by our very own governments, nationally, at the state level, and at the city level. Our lack of education did not prepare us for generational wealth. We have lost land when our ancestors died without wills, estate plans, or no life insurance. Land was passed to children ill-prepared to pay taxes, whether it was lack of jobs or lack of knowledge. But there are generations of wealthy families in this country that are still managing their wealth from the grave. We must do better. In the 50s and 60s, here in Annapolis, there were thriving black communities. And I'm so glad that the mayor spoke on that. Thank you for that introduction. My ancestors owned land in Browns Woods, Mulberry Hill, downtown Annapolis. Some still do, but many acres of land was lost because we were ill-prepared for the wealth of that land. Even if it had substandard housing, the land had value. We all know the story of the Fourth Ward. We all do. We must do better. We were a black Mecca, and I'm excited that the mayor has recognized that and intends to do something about it. But we must be prepared, prepare our children, prepare each other, for what you own today to not lose in the next generation. But keep in mind, this was not just Annapolis. This happened throughout the country. As we migrated out of the South and sharecropping, <laughs> I get emotional on this one. The laws that were on the books did not prepare us or support us. These laws were placed often not enforcing them for black owners. If you go down any MLK Boulevard, is that necessarily the community that you want to live in? I don't think we always honor his memory with some of those communities. And if he showed up at some, he may not be comfortable walking down those streets. But we also have to remember, redlining started in Baltimore, Maryland. Excuse me. Even though redlining, and I'm a banker, is illegal, if it's not enforced, it's just another law on the books. Lending practices. We often pay higher rates due to credit reports income sources, and the lack of the down payment. So how do we combat predatory loan practices? We must know the value of our property. If you're not familiar with the term whitewashing, this is what happens. If I put my house on the market, and I have my beautiful black art on my walls, an appraiser can come into my house and determine what that value is not necessarily on the land, the house, or anything else, but as a black homeowner. If I invite my white friend to come into my house and remove that artwork and call another appraiser, there is a 80% chance that that house value will increase. There are two major laws in Chicago where a lot of these processes started that they will probably lose because the government has taken up the cost. But if you know your value before you start this process, you have a better chance of getting it right. 
I often tell people where I'm from when I go out of town, and I tell them I'm from Annapolis. And this is what happens to me, and this is not a one-time or 20-time thing. Well, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Annapolis. Oh, I've been there. I didn't see any black people. And I refer to that and have been doing this for 40 years. That's the four squares of Annapolis. If you come into Annapolis through Rob Boulevard, what do you see? You see Church Circle, you see downtown Annapolis, you see the Naval Academy, and you see 50 over the bridge. You see white people, you see mansions, yachts, all kinds of things. Where is the diversity in Annapolis? What makes a midshipman want to make Annapolis his home after spending four years here? Where is our social circle? So I often tell people, just like when you go to Baltimore, you go one block over from everywhere you go and you will see us. As someone from Annapolis who spent a lot of time downtown Annapolis as a child, I know where I'm from. I'm excited for our elected officials to show that diversity here in Annapolis. Another story, I have a friend that suffered a, a head trauma in the military. And when he was telling his rehab team where he was from, he said, I live on a place where black people live on the water. He ended up in Portland, Oregon. That's a far cry from Annapolis, where we know where our ancestors made their living on the waters of Annapolis. So remember, zip codes do more than determine where you live. They determine the best and worst of your future. Education, what schools your children will go to, what programs they are exposed to, and what resources may be available. In this country, that should not be a zip code decision. Wealth is determined by your zip code. So the ability to collateralize your debt is a very important, whether you're a business owner or again, the resources that are available to you. These factors are beyond your control and we have to be aware of them to thrive despite of the laws that may not be enforced. So let's talk about the laws of the land. Coming out of slavery, our ancestors had nothing more than our skills and the desire to be free. And as we migrated north, out of servitude and sharecropping, many exploited our skill sets. We were offered lower paying jobs, paid excess taxes, denied union membership, even though they required us to pay union dues. We were then denied the ability to live in close proximity to whites. Housing that the government built with our tax dollars were then denied us to live in. We were crammed into substandard housing. Does that sound familiar? And once again, creating ghettos and charging more rent than most white communities who made more money. But we are a resilient people and became creative with saving our money, hopefully to buy a home, only to find that as soon as we were ready to do that, we were denied. Too many blacks moved into a neighborhood. It was then labeled a black community. Houses became devalued. Insurance would not be available on those houses. No insurance, no mortgage. They were scare tactics that really caused white flight. And again, these are the 40s, 50s, and 60s. What are we seeing different in 2020? but they were scare tactics. And these laws were also created which prevented whites from even selling a house to a black person. People were harassed, threatened, houses burned down. Once your property is destroyed, it has no value. And of course, the insurance company was not reimbursing you at the value of your home, if you could get insurance. So many of these laws are still on the books of many parts of this country. The courts 
particularly the Supreme Court, has had two opportunities to change this. When you talk about elections, they've chosen not to. In 1974, and again in 2007, the current Chief Justice made the decision by stating that the government had an obligation to remedy structural racism caused by the government, but not private racism. As a black person, I don't know the difference. Private racism, go figure that one. But the future still looks bright for me. But there are some things that we have to do and put in the work. In 2021, the Black to the Future Action Fund survey noted that 46% of black adults reported their financial situation as bad. 33% said their economic, their personal economic situation has gotten worse. Recovery as, at, of the downturn has not reached us. We're witnessing that downturn right now. But there is no plan, no vote, no magic pill, and no law that is going to save us. We must save ourselves. You must make a plan. Let's start with protecting our children. Stop placing your bills in your children's name. That is not a joke. Your child's credit is then ruined before they are in high school. So as they begin to apply for student loans or a car to get back and forth to work, their credit will not allow that to happen. They deserve better. Freeze their credit history. That is a free service by all three credit bureaus. And this can often be done online. Many of them have online access. Please, as a banker, fraud is prevalent. And all they need is your child's social security number. And you will not know this has happened until your child gets a bill in the mail at four years old. Let's be real on that. Freeze their credit history. And learn and understand the cycle of money. We are 13% of the population. We control $300 billion in spending in this country. In 2019, 45% of our income went to housing, health care, and higher education, also known as student loans. This is basic foundations that we are spending almost half of our paycheck to survive. Less than 2% of the black dollar stays in the community. Buy black, support black businesses, and start black businesses. For comparison, a dollar circulates for six hours in the black community, 20 days in the Jewish community, and 30 days in an Asian community. Six hours, you cash your check, you go to the store, you spend your money somewhere else, and there's nothing left in your community to support your community. Where are you spending your money? Is it on your belief system, your value system, or somewhere else? Make a, a spending plan and teach your children about money. I used to explain my money situation with my children as my son couldn't hold $5 for five minutes. My daughter probably saved 80% of every paycheck she ever received. It's a lesson in that lesson. Save consistently, but start where you are. Whether it's $5, $10, $50, start where you are and make it consistent. Automate it. Your bank can automatically transfer $5 from your checking account to your savings account every week. That means you now have $20 for that month. You do that consistently. You will have a savings account, an emergency fund, so you're not running around using high overpriced credit cards, payday loans, and all of those other things that should be outlawed. Join your 401k plan. 
I don't care if it's 4% match. That is what we call free money. 403 BCs for the government workers, it's free money. Get it. I ask you highly, especially for women, which is another whole session why we need to save more. We live longer. We have more responsibilities, bigger challenges. Save in your 401k. Stop spending on appearances. Looking like you're rich is not the same as being rich. And I've got a secret that 40 years in banking has taught me. Rich people don't spend their money on clothes and shoes and purses. And I'm a purseaholic. Trust me. I couldn't get a down payment on my house off my purses. You might have watched that Sex in the City episode. I sat there like this. Been there. Save your money. Make a will, especially if you have children. If you do not want the government deciding how your money should be spent and where your children will go, you need a will. Obtain homeowners and renters insurance. The number of people having catastrophes in their house with no insurance to replace their goods. You work hard for those. $30, $40 a month for insurance is very important to replace those items. Save your raise. If you've been living off of money and you get a raise, save it. You're already living off the difference. Save it. Get life insurance. Again, that's very important. That is not just a death benefit. It's a way of preserving your legacy. Plan for your future. In closing, financial insecurity is real. And there is profit in your financial literacy. That free money you received last year was not free. Look at the prices of what we're paying and understand if you do nothing to change, nothing changes. Thank you. I just had to mention Mulberry Hill. <laughs> Since it was brought up, you know. Exactly. You know, and some Henson's. <laughs> um, wow, thank you so much. That was... That was uh, both educational and uh, inspiring at the same time. And, and that's appropriate when we're talking about the future, right? Because, you know, those are uh, stark realities, but um, there's an opportunity to build on, on some of that, that knowledge, right, and, and change the course. So I wanted to really quickly um, just reiterate some of what I heard. And this is, um, this is not intended for you all to pull out your notebooks, but if you want to, you can. Um, so we can capture some of this. So a thousand books by kindergarten, um, the school to prison pipeline, which is important to understand, uh, you know, and, and what that means on what we see. Um, reading stories that change the conversation, which I, I, you know, I'm a strong proponent of that. Um, creating options for children, understanding the early benefits of trade school, and the value of hard work. Um, so those are some of the ones that resonated with me. Um, and then lastly, join your 401k programs, as well as save more and make a will. Um, so moving into our next section and our next speaker, I wanted to recommend um, some books to you all. So this might be another opportunity to take notes, if you, if you dare. Um, one that's appropriate to what, to what you spoke of, Ms. Coates, is uh, The Black Butterfly which is a book that, that taught me a lot about um, and just piqued my interest in understanding some of the dynamics that created uh, the city of Baltimore and by proxy some other cities, much like the city of Annapolis, as it results, um, as it deals with housing and economics um, and policy. The other is Cass, which uh, speaks to the origins of our discontent, um, and, and that speaks to race issues as well as some other more historic issues that land us where we are today. And the last one is The Color of Law. And The Color of Law is an excellent book if you're interested in understanding housing policies and kind of what lands us where we are right now. 
and creating some solutions as to how we can be more aware of that and move out of that. So thank you very much, uh, Michelle Coates. Thank you. So next up, we have Stacy King. And I'm smiling as I say this uh, because there's several de uh, degrees of separation between Stacy and myself. Um, I think we go back to uh, way back when we were younger. I'll just say that we were younger. Um, so Stacy, uh, in, in my uh, summation and kind of uh, biography, it would be that she uh, is both uh, an educator and someone who has always been and continues to be interested in the education of our young people, um, but also um, strong background in social services and understanding how those services connect to a lot of what you, what you were speaking of, um, but also uh, they speak to being able to empower our young people to navigate this extremely complex system that we find ourselves in. So we find ourselves as adults dealing with all of these variables, but you can imagine being a young person and having to navigate these things. Um, she has both supervised uh, large staffs of people, but also worked in, uh, in, a, in a great deal of one-on-one of -on -one services as it relates to after-school programming and working with young people in, in, in our communities in the city of Annapolis. And so I want to bring you Stacy King. Good evening, everyone. Before I fulfill my assignment this evening, I just want to first acknowledge and thank Mayor Gavin Buckley for his vision of creating one Annapolis. And I want to thank Adatola Adi for the opportunity to present and discuss the education proponent of Annapolis. And also, it's, it's um, really good to be introduced to you all by Will. Uh, I, I call him Will. But um, because he suffered such a health challenge, and he has been a blessing to our community, and he continues to be a blessing to our community. So it's very well good to see you. Um, continue to, to support and, and navigate the complexity of, um, of what happens in our culture. When I was asked by Tola to present on education, I said, Tola, education, why me? I said, I am not a teacher. I I have never worked at the Board of Education. My background is mainly child welfare. Why me? <clears throat> and I began to think about my career and the things that I've experienced. <clears throat> I am an Annapolitan. I was educated in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. And I, too, just as a previous speaker who spoke on the past, I too was told by my guidance counselor that I should not consider going to college because I was not good enough. Those were her words. <clears throat> Another guidance counselor overheard that and quickly pulled me into her office. So I publicly want to give thanks to Mrs. Helen Turner. Although I don't speak of it often, words have impact. How you choose to deal with those words is up to you. I could have believed that I was not going to be good enough to be a college-educated African-American female. But I chose to allow that moment to elevate me, to do better, so that I can make a change or make a difference so other children 
will not be in that situation of being told that they're not good enough. I made a promise that as long as I was in Annapolis, that I was going to continue to use the platforms and the opportunities to talk to the community and the youth to let them know that it is so much beyond the city of Annapolis. You can be and you can do anything you want to as long as those opportunities are provided. We are in a peculiar situation when it comes to education. Our children were already stressed with limitations. then you put a pandemic in the midst. A pandemic that exposed and exacerbated the inequality and exposed an achievement gap and exposed the disparities of education. And you may ask, what can we do about this? What will we do about this? Well, I say to you, we can use our voice. We can also exercise our rights to vote. And you may say, how does voting impact the future of education. Voting is everything. Voting starts and allows people to make choices about your child, my child, your grandchildren's education. My fellow community residents of Annapolis, we must learn to be proactive and not reactive. We must know our rights and we must learn to exercise our rights. I, it's so much we can talk about when it relates to education in the future. For the future is, is, is unknown. We can prepare, but it is unknown. And it's broad. Ms. Coates spoke about parents being your child's first teacher. That is true. Prior to this event starting, I did share with a couple of individuals that I believe that education starts at home. Education starts in the womb. Education starts with you reading to your children in the womb. Education starts with singing to your children. Education comes from expressions that you give to your children. School elevates that. Parents, you set the tone, you set the foundation and the expectation of the future of your child's education. So I say to you, Annapolis, it's up to you. I want to know, and, and to the, the individuals that are viewing on Facebook, think about this. How many of us know? the individuals that serve on the board, the Board of Education. Do you know who the president of our board of education? Color.
I present to you the board that speaks for you, speaks for us, speaks for our children. What's the representation looking like on that board? Think about it. This next school year, we will be transitioning to another superintendent. What are the expectations we have for that superintendent? Who's going to share what our vision is for our children? Is it going to be the representation on this board? I believe Ms. Corinne Frank is going to be one that's going to be leading the charge. Not only should you look at the pictures of the faces on here, but you should also get to know their background. Does the background reflect what it is we want to see in our community? Their beliefs, their understanding that, yes, all lives matter. But it's not until we close this achievement gap that we will see that all lives matter. Not until we come together and make sure that all of our children have the necessary equipment to be able to successfully engage in virtual learning. Every child should be equipped to be able to fulfill the goals and the mission of Anne Arundel County Public School System. Every child should have access to and from school. So ladies and gentlemen, if we want to have better, we must do better. And in doing better, we must remember who represents us. Call them, write them, go to the board. This is open access to anyone who can navigate through Anne Arundel County Public Schools website. It is the strategic plan. The strategic plan that they have set out from 2018 to 2023. One is to increase the percentage of students, families, staff, and partners who report feeling like a valuable member of school system that we're in. Increase the percentage of students who report that Anne Arundel County Public School staff care for and support them. Increase the use of restorative practices in schools and offices. Increase the number of stories staff and students are able to share about one another's life experiences. Increase the percentage of students who read on or above grade level by the end of the second grade, meaning when you go into public schools, parents, it is important that 
your child know the alphabet, knows how to say and spell his or her own name. That's important. That's what I said, parents are our children or your children's first teacher, setting the foundation. I was blessed to have an, uh, an early childhood educator, none other than my aunt, Claudia Lloyd. So before I went to kindergarten, I knew my alphabet. I knew my numbers and some other things that um, she felt that it was so necessary for me to know. Increase the percentage of students in grade 9 to 12 who meet or exceed expectations on standardized English and mathematic assessments. Now we know some assessments or, or our children are overly assessed um, and having to take these assessments, but they're the requirements. However, communicating with the teachers, communicating with the board and the board members are all critical factors that go into understanding these standardized tests and assessments. Increased percentage of diploma-bound high school seniors who score a three or better on an AP, AP ex examination, four or better on an IB examination, or earn a Maryland industry certification. These programs are excellent programs, but only if you're given the opportunity to learn about those programs and have access to those programs. I believe in the future that these programs will, will be open to everyone and not available only if you get through by lottery. The magnet programs are very important. I have a son who went through the STEM program and I have a daughter who is in the 11th grade and is currently in cosmetology. Now, is cosmetology her field that she chooses to go in? No. Her goal is to become a neonatal nurse. But cosmetology is a field that she felt that she should be able to go to to make a couple dollars as a college student. So yes, these trade, trade opportunities are very important. And we need to encourage our young people to participate in these trades. Increase the percentage of ninth graders who matriculate to the 10th grade status after one year. Increase the percentage of students attending school on a daily basis. The expectations for school starts at home. When your child knows what your expectation is and that you have a zero tolerance for absences, it sets a tone, not only that you're going to school, but it sets a tone that Education is everything. It's everything. It is your vehicle that's going to drive you through your career, your life. Education never stops as long as you live. It continues till the day you pass. Increase instructional opportunity to, to explore multiple cultural and ethnic perspectives. When I shared with 
my daughter and her friends about my assignment today, I asked them, what do you see as the future in education in Annapolis? I didn't talk to them as one group. It was one, one-on-one. -on -one. And they talked about inclusion. They talked about diversity. In an actual African-American studies curriculum, a class um, that's going to discuss not only Dr. King and slavery, but talk about the African-American contributions to society. The African-Americans here in Annapolis. All those things are things that came from our youth. We just have to present them with a platform to be able to share their vision. They talked about mental health. But before I get to that component, I'm going to finish reviewing the strategies. And again, increase the diversity within all workforce units in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. All work units, not from the janitorial staff on up to the superintendent. We as African Americans have the highest rate of students in special education. But wouldn't you know the leaders or the administration of special education does not reflect the individuals they're serving. Nor have they been in the communities of the individuals they're serving. As teachers that may not be familiar with the behaviors that they see in these special education um, programs don't understand that last night I witnessed my father beat my mother. Or last night I didn't eat because I gave my dinner to my little brother or sister. I have the same uniform on because my mother or my father did not have enough money for the laundry. I did not eat because my mother or my father didn't have money for the groceries, but opted to pay the rent. Yes, you may say that there are food pantries around. Absolutely, they are. But transportation has always been an issue here in Anne Arundel County. Increase the percentage of students completing career-based professional internships. Now, I have to applaud our delegate because she, as I read and, and see her posts, she's always advocating and encouraging internships. Internships at the state level where you can see where things get done in the government and laws are passed, those internships drive our young people to want to do better. If I want to be a nurse, I should be able to have an internship at the hospital. If I want to build, I should be able to get an internship at an at a architecture firm where 
they can, you know, expand that knowledge and, and get an understanding at an early age to see if this is what I want to do. We have to give them opportunities to peak that's going to peak their interest. Increase the percentage of students total and unique involved annually in clubs, organizations, competitions, or other co-curricular offerings. Increase the number of comprehensive classrooms which are enrolled at or below Anne Arundel County Public Schools recommended student to teacher ratios. We have more we have more children, students, than we do have classrooms. And so we have to navigate and, and work on that process. Increase the number of community-based opportunities for service learning for all students and families. And lastly, external organizations will validate Anne Arundel County Public Schools effective business practices and fiscal prudence. So as you depart from here and go to your designated spaces, Read over these strategies. Access them. They're shared on the website. Think about your children, your grandchildren, the children in your community. Ask yourself, what is your vision for education within our community? What changes have you seen? Is it enough? Do these strategies meet the needs of our community. Out of all of the information that I shared with you today, the one thing I cannot stress enough is the importance of exercising your right to vote. Your vote matters. Our children matter. They deserve it. So in closing, I just want to leave with you all this thought. Your vote determines the future of education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stacy. Um, so a few takeaways. I'm going to be moving a little faster because I don't want to keep you all longer than we had planned uh, this evening, um, is that we can do anything we want to do as long as those opportunities are provided. Um, achievement gap uh, is something we need to pay attention to, and, and don't forget about that. Also, that there are disparities, continuing disparities in education. and also of importance, do we really know who represents us on the Anne Arundel County Board of Education, uh, which is an aspect of the presentation. Also, what expectations do we have of the incoming and new superintendent, as well as um, the fact that uh, every child should have access to and from school, and that if we want better, that we have to do better. And it, that may be inverted, but, um, and, and also remember who represents us. So uh, moving on, some other books for you all um, that, that touch into that, um, that I found useful for me is, um, one is called Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? And I don't know if any of you all ever heard of that book, but um, it's pretty awesome. Talks about the psychology of racism and and, and how to have those conversations, the tough conversations around race. The other for me, and this is, un, this is, this can be controversial, but in the educational realm, 
uh, a, you know, book that was useful for me, um, and that was a book by Howard Zinn called a People's History of the United States of America, A People's History of the United States of America, which is, which is um, kind of fills in some of those gaps. Um, we, we probably need to have a different conversation about CRT, what they're, you know, what's been called uh, CRT, um, and what that really means, and you know, when we talk about educating our young people about um, African Americans. So this is an excellent subway, I, uh, segue, I think, into our next speaker, um, because one of the things that Stacy mentioned was what some of our young people need to learn about. Um, and I thought, you know, because you said teaching students about, you know, some of the people in Annapolis, right? Um, and I really think they need to learn about, um, you know, phenomenal women and phenomenal people like um, Delegate Shanika Henson, um, because not only is she homegrown, but she is um, extremely dynamic. And in every sense of the clinical definition of that word of, of dynamic, um, having served in the House of Delegates, but also um, being um, uh, passing the Maryland Bar in 2010 um, and serving on the city council for the city of Annapolis um, in, a, in a ward where we really needed her. And um, she upped the ante on us and moved her representation to a broader area and was able to actually sit on committees that greatly impacted the people who live in the city of Annapolis not just African Americans, but all people. Um, but uh, you know, we are incredibly proud of her, and I want to take this opportunity to have uh, Delegate Shanika Henson come say a few words. For us. Will, in addition to being dynamic, is my cousin, so I have to embrace him with a hug when I see him. Um, <laughs> I believe my assignment is to talk about elections. Um, and then the whole context for this conversation is the future. And when I saw that, I said, man, I wish I would have been here a couple nights ago when it was the past. Um, because when I think about the future and I think about politics and elections, we have so much work to do. We have so much ground to cover. There are still so many executive elected and appointed positions that black people have not yet held and impacted in our city, in our county, and in our state. Being the first black woman to represent Annapolis in Annapolis has been a true honor and a privilege. But if you know how I got here, you know that I was appointed to this position. So instead of the 80,000 constituents that I represent choosing me for it, it was a panel of nine people who got to make that decision. And black women not holding this seat is not for lack of trying. We have put our names in, we have been on the ballot, and we have given it our all. And for whatever reason, the 80,000 people in this district have not yet made that choice. I hope to be able to break that glass ceiling and to open that door and to be an entry point because whenever I speak to young people, I tell them I am the first, but I do not plan to be the last that someone else will occupy that space and will take that mantle. We look at our circuit court. We just appointed the very first African-American woman to represent us and to sit on the circuit court for Anne Arundel County. And how did she get there? Because a courageous woman named Claudia Barber, who was already a judge, an administrative judge, decided to put her name on the ballot. And what it cost her was great. What it cost her was tremendous. But she understood that we had ground yet to cover, even in a progressive city like Annapolis. When we look at our mayor's office, we thank our mayor for his care for the community, but we understand that we still have roads left to go. We have not yet had a black woman serve as mayor. We have not yet reelected a black man as mayor. We've had Mayor John T. Chambers, but we have not yet reelected a black man as mayor in the city of Annapolis. So we understand that as we lift up the examples that we have, we have so much room left to grow as a people. In the 70s and the 60s, the Black Panthers would say that the power was to the people. 
And it's a phrase that I believe, but when I say it, I add a little something different to it. The power is to the people who show up. When we look at our communities and the numbers that we have and the strength and the potential of what we can add by way of influence to the process, far too often we give that power away by simply not showing up. So we understand that when we look at the electorate in Annapolis, if we take our constituencies and we break them down by demographics, when we look at the white voters in this area, they're about half and half Democrat and Republican. You got you know, some on both sides, some on the other. It is the turnout of the black vote that has made the difference in election after election after election. When you look at my predecessor in office, the person for whom this library is named and dedicated, Michael Bush, he understood that it was the black community's voter turnout that was gonna make the difference. If he was gonna be able to win by a large margin, like he did in his very last election in 2018, or if he was gonna win by a slim majority, like he did in the prior election, where the Republican candidate got more votes than he did. When we look at our community, our strength is in our numbers, but it is only there if we use those numbers and if we show up and if we're present. I have seen firsthand the calculations that are made when people are deciding to be bold with their political action, Darius Stanton always says be bold for good. When people are making those decisions, the secret and quiet calculations and thoughts of every elected official is who has my back if I'm going to do this. Alderwoman Pendell Charles knows that because parole consistently supports her. And at the same time, there's that accountability that's there. But when you are deciding what to do with the state's $80 billion, you are making value judgments based on who's showing up, who's present, who's accountable, who's going to hold you accountable based on what it is with what you do with the authority that the people have given you. So if a community doesn't show up, their ability to influence a process is taken away from them. I look at our speaker, Adrian Jones the very first black woman to serve as Speaker of the House in the state of Maryland, and one of only a small minority of black speakers across the country. When she was voted in, she said, I don't want to just be the first black speaker. I want to do something for black people. So she created a black agenda, and she shopped it all around. And colleagues of mine who you know, don't look like me, they said, why is it a black agenda? Why isn't it an agenda for everyone? But what she understood is that the success of black Marylanders is vital to the success of Maryland. I'm going to say that again. The success of black Marylanders is vital to the success of Maryland. When we look at those who are long-term incarcerated, we judge that by 10 years or more in the state of Maryland, 70% of them are African Americans. When we look at home ownership rates by demographics, the least likely person to own a home is the black person. Even other communities who have immigrated here and who have had the longevity that black community does in Annapolis, they are still more likely to own the home that they are putting their key in the door in at the end of the night than an African American. So we understand that as a state, we will put a ceiling and a limitation on ourselves as long as we don't invest in the black community. So when Speaker Jones put her agenda together, she said police reform is obviously number one, but there are other things that black Maryland needs to thrive. And one of the first things that she did was settled a lawsuit that had been brewing for 12 years. What the lawsuit said was that the state of Maryland was intentionally discriminating against our own HBCUs. What was happening was, if the University of you know, UMBC was down the street from, let's say, a Coppin State University, the state of Maryland would decide, we want to put the most premier economics program at UMBC. We will hire and retain the best professors. We will advertise it to the most people, and we will make sure that this is a world-class program and that people will want to go there. Well, at the university that was an HBCU that was its neighbor, 
they would decide we won't give that sort of investment. We won't hire the world-class professor. We won't advertise and retain the top talent for these institutions. We will give them just enough to continue to get by. And year after year after year of an intentional system to compete and drive out the talent from our HBCUs resulted in low enrollment numbers, resulted in a mighty few students who were there because they wanted to see their culture reflected back to them, but sometimes they had to do it at the detriment of a world-class education. So when our speaker came in, she said, I won't continue to let this happen. And one of the first things she did was invested $577 million into Maryland's four HBCUs to again make them world-class institutions. It was incredible. It was incredible to cast a vote for that. It was incredible to see that, to see our four HBCU presidents all together saying that Morgan isn't better than Coppin, that Bowie isn't better than UMES, but each one of our institutions must thrive in order for black Marylanders to be uplifted. And in order for our state to thrive, black Marylanders must be uplifted. When we looked at police reform, Maryland was the first state to adopt the Law Enforcement Officers' Bill of Rights. And it seemed appropriate that with the first black speaker in office that we would be the first state to repeal the Law Enforcement Officers' Bill of Rights. And we did. We did under her leadership. She was very clear that what we had seen across the country in Minneapolis, Minnesota with George Floyd and Baltimore City with Freddie Gray is something that we have the absolute power to change. We have the ability to intervene, to stop it in its tracks, and to turn it around. So what did we do? We limited the use of no-knock warrants to make sure that people like Breonna Taylor could feel safe in their homes instead of feeling as though an officer could burst your door down and respond to you with gunfire at any time of any day. We made sure there were additional training and hiring standards for our officers to put in place a red flag law to make sure that if an officer had been fired for misconduct in one jurisdiction, that they could not easily find a job in the state of Maryland and be deputized with the power of life and death. But we made sure that there's a plan in place to screen those officers out. We made sure that the good officers that are on the job have the mental health support that they need that they have a system where they can report misconduct and not fear reprisal from their colleagues. We built a structure where our law enforcement could again be a part of our community and not be seen as adversaries on both sides. We understand how vitally, that important, how vitally important that is to public safety in the state of Maryland. And then the speaker said, I have to tackle our economics. I have to look at what we're doing there. So as uh, Ms. Coates alluded to and spoke about very brilliantly in her presentation, the speaker took on the appraisal gap. And Ms. Coates has explained to us what that means. When one home of similar character is undervalued than another home of similar character, and it's done on a basis of discrimination, sometimes implicit bias, sometimes intentional practices, but for whatever reason it's done, the speaker understood and acknowledged that it couldn't continue. So the system that we have in place now is a work group that's studying how do we get money to homeowners. If the system won't rightfully value your property, your house of similar character, then we will give you money to make sure that you can build up, develop, and add on to that house so that it is irrefutable that this home has value. That was the leadership of our speaker to make sure that black Marylanders could pass wealth on generation after generation. So as I look at the future of elections and politics in Annapolis in this area, I understand that we have so much work left to do, but I feel hopeful about the people who are here to do it. When I left my seat on the city council to go to the House of Delegates, a young man named Dewan Gay succeeded me in office on the city council. And when they would report on him every time for maybe the first two or three months, they would say, Dewan Gay, who succeeded Delegate Shanika Henson in office. So I got to be next to him in print and in history forever. And when I see his passion, 
when I see his clear-cut focus on the people who need him the most, it makes me hopeful that we are still inspiring and raising leaders who will pick up the mantle, who will do the hard work, and who will make sure that we continue to have progressive policies that support and uplift black Maryland. So I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful about it. And Dewan helps me remain hopeful about it. I see my colleagues in the House of Delegates. The Legislative Black Caucus has 58 members. It is the largest black caucus in the United States. I'm going to say that again. The Maryland Legislative Black Caucus has 58 members and is the largest black caucus in the United States. Yes, we should be proud of that. We should be proud of that. There are states with far more population and far more elected officials, but it is Maryland who sees the value in the people here who can step up and serve. And I think that our state is and has always been a special place. We are the home of Frederick Douglass, the home of Thurgood Marshall, the home of Harriet Tubman. It is completely appropriate that we would continue to raise, develop, and inspire leaders who can not only lead in the state of Maryland, but who can lead the charge across the country through the example of their leadership of what we are capable of as a people. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak on elections. I thank you, Will, for your diligent work in the area of African-American history, culture, preservation, and uplifting. And I hope that everyone soaks in what they've heard today and leaves her motivated to the next leg. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Henson. And I will say we, we can never compliment uh, each other too much, and we should always do so. But um, did, someone was telling me, a couple people actually told me about um, the video that you worked on for our Choice Neighborhoods um, uh, application and planning process, and they said that you were you 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 hit it out of the park, and I, you know I wasn't surprised. So thank you for that. Um, so in looking at my watch and looking at where we are, I want to be sure we keep it moving, um, which is always really hard for me to do because there's so much I want to share. Um, our next speaker um, is, is, in fact, Alderman Dewan Gay. Um, there's so much I can say about him. Uh, you can make your way up as I'm saying these things um, because um, he is a young, young human being, um, but I'm always surprised by how, first of all, how, how much he understands policy, how much he understands his role, how much he advocates for people who do not have a voice um, in this city, but in particular in the communities that he was raised in, um, and the fact that he has, and not a lot of people know this, but you know, when you're that age, you have a lot of dreams and ambitions, and they don't always align with what you're doing at that time. So I want to say that I know he has made a lot of sacrifices um, to forego other things that he he, he may want to do because he's, he's a very talented young man. Um, and so I just want to say that I'm grateful, and I believe all of us are grateful for his contributions to this city, not just as a politician or a policymaker, but because we need, just as we know that we need, strong African-American women to be present in our communities and, and to be at every table, we also need strong young African-American men. And you know, we have the, the, the ability, as, as Delegate Henson said, we have the ability to rewrite these history books. And by having people at the table who can, who can actively embody that, I, I think we have a, you know, a fighting chance. So Alderman Dewan Gay, I hope I didn't embarrass you. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Um, I appreciate all the speakers that went before me today. I think this has been great um, and informative. Uh, the entire series, really, been following the others on um, Facebook. And so um, I, I appreciate the city of Annapolis for hosting that, hosting this series. I want to start off with that. Um, and also acknowledging Delegate Henson. Uh, 
Ash, I, I laughed as soon as you said, you know, the papers have mentioned us, me coming after her, and then here I am still coming after her forever. We will be linked in, <laughs> in history. Uh, but I love it, though, and, and you provided a ton of education and assistance throughout this process, as well as what uh, Will has mentioned. I think I uh, have a great working relationship with both him and Adatola um, in the mayor's office as it relates to issues that are um, priority to our community, and so grateful for that as well. Um, I guess I'll just jump in right into everything, considering that so much of it has been touched on um, uh, briefly today. Uh, but just starting with saying, you know, we're fortunate to live in the city that acknowledges our history, as I just mentioned, and is willing to discuss both positive and negative trials we face through the city's history. Uh, for me, it, it was incredibly important growing up, as mentioned here in uh, the city of Annapolis. I moved here uh, probably at age 12 or 13. I had just started middle school uh, after my family had moved around a lot within the county, uh, moving originally from Baltimore City, uh, Severna Park, Glen Burnie. And so for me to come to Annapolis um, and to be fully immersed into this culture um, and community and family that they had, I've always been extremely appreciative of that um, and consider myself an adopted son of the city. But I think what was unique was um, a focus amongst the youth and amongst the families uh, to share the stories of their heritage here within uh, the city of Annapolis, whether it be in single family housing or public housing. It was so rich and uh, always focuses on what we are now and continues to um, you know, shape our future. Um, and so I, I just think that's incredibly important in mentioning uh, the history that uh, this city has. And I don't want to uh, dwell on it too much, but more focus on some of the future here tonight. I mention that because the city has played a pivotal role in the foundation of this nation and our democracy. A democracy that is now an extremely fragile yet so valuable. I often banter with friends as it relates to my love for government and the history of this nation, being someone who truly believes that at the core of democracy, it intends to give the people power. So you may question why do people disengage from politics and throw away their opportunity to be heard? Why do my friends push back at the concept of rallying behind democracy? Well, for young people, uh, we feel that although it may have started as a vehicle to give a voice to the voiceless, all too often the desires of the majority are silenced by bureaucracy, special interests, and the inability of our leaders to collaborate effectively. Coupled with an understanding that if we share the same hue of skin tone, or if you identify as a woman or a member of the LGBTQ plus community, those promises weren't guaranteed at the inception of our nation, but through death, bondage, and decades of civil unrest were gained. However, what we have to realize is that as my, my second favorite president says, my first favorite is John F. Kennedy, it's a long story, but as Barack Obama says, those founding documents are just a piece of parchment. And he said that in his final uh, address in Chicago, and it just always stuck with me. And I'm like, well, what does he mean by that? The Constitution is just a piece of parchment. And it means that those words have no authority without action, bringing me back to the point that people rule the democracy. Those words have no authority without action. The power is guaranteed to us in two ways. The first being our vote, as mentioned previously. Over the last few years, we've heard a number of politicians argue that this is the vote of our lives and that democracy is on the line. And to be honest, many of us are suffering from political fatigue and the numbing of the cries for democracy. While it may be exhausting and repetitive, it is true. It doesn't mean you have to vote for the person saying it, but pay attention to elections. Educate yourselves on the candidates and their policies. Elect people that you believe can change your, circumstance, your circumstances through their voice and their actions. Secondly, civic engagement. As the delegate just mentioned, uh, the state of Maryland is one of the first in the country to, reappor, uh, to repeal the law enforcement's bill of rights. And I don't think that for a second any of us can think that that would have happened without the momentum 
and the conversation that young people started across this country in the year 22, uh, 2020 due to the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery unrest. That civil unrest, that engagement, our repetitiveness showing up every single day, even here in Annapolis, just at uh, our city dock, disrupting business, disrupting the flow of traffic, making our neighbors uncomfortable, that forced conversation, that forced people to write their elected officials, that forced people to reach out to their city council people, to their police department. I think that when the chief of police from the city of Annapolis and the mayor were forced to take a knee with hundreds and hundreds of demonstrators just in front of the city, uh, city hall downtown, I think that spoke volumes, and I think it helped my colleagues, some of which who didn't realize the importance of our protest, understand that it was important to put these issues on the docket. And that birthed the uh, policy that, my, that the alderman from Ward 7 proposed. And although it failed, it was important that we had that discussion. That trickled and coupled with the state legislation uh, that did pass helped us realize our true power um, and our true potential in engaging uh, our political system and our political process. Coupled with that, civic engagement is you know, a lot when you show up to these protests and we rally and we get disruptive, but it is just as important to show up to our city council meetings. It is just as important to show up to committee meetings. That is where the bulk of the work is done. And the echoes from the protests are faint in the council chambers without the physical bodies, meaning that it is fine for us to show up with 500 on a Saturday, but we need to do the same exact thing on the second and fourth Monday of the month when our budget priorities are being discussed, when our housing priorities are being discussed, and differences that could change our livelihood. Young people as sons, sisters, uncles, aunts, parents, nieces, and nephews, it is our responsibility to follow through. It has been done before and it can be done again. United States Congressman John Lewis forced conversation in the community at, at just age 20 years old. Dr. King once said our lives begin to end and they would become silent to the things that matter. As young people, we must dream of a future motivated by Dr. King's words of wisdom speaking out and fighting against any change that slows down the progression of our people. So speak out, against the, uh, speak out about the effects of mass incarceration and how it accelerates the fall of our black families. Spread, uh, speak out against the poor quality of housing that has been ignored for decades and falls short of the standards we have set for ourselves. Speak out against the achievement gap that continues to grow within our county and hinder the, ability, the, hinder the ability of our youth to succeed in the classroom. Speak out against issues that are important to you. We have answered the call and now the task to fulfill Dr. King's dream rests at our feet. And we're ready for the moment. We've got the skills and the uh, knowledge gained in neighborhoods and schools across the city. We have those who come before us in the stands who will support us every single step of the way. But most importantly, we have ourselves and all the heart, grit, and resiliency, energy, and the numbers it takes to see it through. Every face may not be seen, every voice may not be heard, but young men and women in mass numbers have organized, marched, forced conversation, created organizations, and we've let anyone willing to listen know that we are not interested in standing idly by while the dream is further derailed. And as we know, this fight will not be easy and our way for it will not always be clear. But if we rise above the noise and the pressures that surround us, if we stay true to who we are and remember the streets that help hone those skills we'll use as young adults, if we have faith in the plan of which other God or goddess we choose to worship, then our greatest moments are the ones that lie ahead. And so I truly do have faith uh, in our city uh, in the state of Black Annapolis. So thank you all very much. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so 
Alderman Gay said, speak up or speak out, show up, and that we are ready for the moment uh, for the moment ahead of us. We are ready for the moment ahead of us, and that we have all of the heart, grit, and resiliency that we need to move forward. So thank you. Um, moving right ahead, um, we are going to be wrapping up soon, and there's so much on the agenda that we wanted to cover. So that means we're going to have to do this again, right? <laughs> Um, so our next speaker um, is Marcus On Point Hayes, and he is multiple things. He's an artist, he is a performer, he is a songwriter, um, and he is someone who himself does show up. And um, I know from personal experience that he expands whatever conversation he's involved in. Um, and uh, he's, he's um, always thinking outside of the box, which is something I think we, we all desperately need, is to have these out-of-the-box conversations because that's how we learn, right? And that's how we evolve. So, Marcus, thank you. All righty. Um, hello. A lot of good things said, I just want to say. I want to uh, thank everybody before me for speaking on this matter. Um, I myself, I've been in Annapolis for, mostly live on the outskirts, so I've lived in Annapolis most of my life. And um, what I've learned to bring as an artist to the sea and observing for a long time, that might be my hand, let me double check. Is that my hand? Yeah. <laughs> Always got important people calling me, you know, I mean, I'm doing stuff. <laughs> Um, but anyways, um, so I've observed from a long time, even on the outskirts. I live, most of my life has been lived near Rolling Knolls on the outskirts of Annapolis. Um, I grew up there. I went to um, Rolling Knolls Elementary. I also went to um, Annapolis Area Christian School for a little bit. And because of my uh, father's job, I've lived overseas. and I've been overseas and back a couple of times during my adolescence growing up. Um, so I saw a lot of the, uh, my bad, I've seen... Uh, I have a, a, a diverse background, and uh, I've observed a lot. So in regards to music and arts and, what, and the way in which I used to communicate, I always thought that was a great way to uh, bring people together. In my way of growing up, I would seek the arts to help make sense of some of the things I was going through. And I also observed how it brought people together. Uh, people like to feel good, and music Outside of, you know, making you travel and learn about your history, it, it makes you feel good. And you can relate with other people. And um, during my, uh, my travels and then coming back to Annapolis, I ended up graduating from Annapolis High School. Um, I went to three different schools coming up. And going to Annapolis, so maybe, I saw it in Rolling Knolls. I mean, yeah, Rolling Knolls Elementary as a kid. And then I went overseas. And I saw where I was perhaps accepted in a foreign country a bit more than I was maybe even back here where I call home. Um, I would return back. I saw the divisiveness and some of the, the subtle racism and segregation in the elementary schools. I also saw in Annapolis High when I was a bit older and able to take in even more of it. I remember going into the cafeteria and seeing the cafeteria somewhat divided where more of the white kids would be on this side and the black children would be on this side. And then, I normally find myself in the middle. Um, my background is I do have black on both sides, but I also have a mixed background as well as part of my heritage. So I've always taught to treat everybody as equally as possible and to respect you know, their culture and learn from that. Um, so I'm saying on that too, I observed a lot of this and I thought that you know, also growing up in the city, I didn't see a lot of outlets for us. I didn't see a lot of outlets to where we can go out and be who we are. We're not really taught a lot of our, our culture in the schools, um, very minuscule, um, and we're not really surrounded by it optically here too much. And if it is, it's more downtrodden, I believe. Um, so when I decided to go publicly with me uh, using my art to express myself, I wanted to help create an outlet here in the city. Um, and I, would, I formed a group at the time to where we had a diverse background 
and we were performing a lot in the city. And we would go into, um, we would work with the community action agency, we would work with the public schools, we did shows in Annapolis High, we did other outlet um, performances to help um, people understand um, if you're not getting certain education or certain things in, in school, you can maybe find it through us, maybe you can find it through the arts, and we can help you create. Maybe that can help rehabilitate your community and your family, and we did certain writing shops and things like that. Um, so I did a lot of that work during that certain time period to hopefully help spark something, to help spark a change, and to bring the sides to, together to work together to help bring that change. Um, over time, I remember having a lot of fights and times during the city to help bring these events together and do music festivals and things like that. And I, I had a lot of red tape and a lot of hard time doing that because I represented, you know, the face of hip hop in Annapolis. I had grown to that level over time. And to a lot of people that were, it had a, a stigma to it and they thought it would bring violence or drugs or anything, then that wasn't who I was. It's not who I am and that's not what I represented. And I think a lot of people knew that. And I was able to eventually bring people together and do a music festival. And that music festival with the arts and the appointment of entertainment is we all, whether Democrat, Republican, independent, whatever our belief systems are, mostly the arts and the music can bring us together. And we can maybe agree on having fun and feeling good. And then from there, we connect. And from there, that's how I got involved more in the city, and that's how I got to know people. And that's primarily why I think that is very important here in our city, and to respect that and respect the ones prior to that who have done that, to have entertained to help, you know, bring a community together. And I think the more we can um, appreciate people's cultures, the better. And I would... I've always yearned to see more of that and to see there wasn't too many places where I can go to just pop up and perform and be respected as a performer and a professional and get compensated what I believe I was worth. I had to fight for that. And other people had to fight for that too prior to me to get to the level that I was at in the city to do what I was able to do. And even then I still received personally, not just me and my, my people that I was working with at the time, received you know, negative words or um, people would try to do things to downplay what was actually done. Um, I could go on, I could write a book on that probably, but the truth of the matter is I love our people. I love all people in general. And I think at this point, we have grown to a point where um, we are starting to see more of us represented in the upper echelon of this city. And I believe we're starting to crack through I believe this current administration has done a fantastic job with doing so. I believe we will continue to do so. And um, I would like to continue to be a part of it. I continue to be an artist. Um, you know, um, last year I was, uh, I was blessed to perform at the Kunta Kende Festival and also do a uh, spoken poetry piece for Alex Haley's 100th birthday through the Haley family. There was a moment there when um, I was doing a piece and I, I, the emotions of that hit me, because truthfully and transparently, I don't know the depth of my history and my ancestry as well and deep as I should. And I believe others may be miseducated through the education system to not feel and believe that they are that. And I saw a piece earlier today about Malcolm X speaking on that, like who taught you that your hair wasn't pretty or your face, your skin wasn't beautiful, you know? A lot of times our educational system is taught to domesticate us or to be a certain way, I believe. And that needs to be changed. And I, I get mad at how I was educated on finances or miseducated and not taught about. And Ms. Coates, I heard you say something about how we spend our money. And I've learned to stop saying spend. How are we gonna circulate our money? How are we gonna invest that? How's that gonna come back? When I put that out, how's that gonna come back or multiply? Because typically when I'm spending it, it's gone. And I don't wanna be that way anymore. And I don't want our family, I don't want the future children to be like that anymore. And we're taking the right steps now. We have the right people to do that. And it's taking panels like this, 
for us to come outside the box to speak on this, to try to get to the truth of how we can rebuild and feel accepted. And we don't have to have just a 28-day month to talk about our culture. It should be year-round, you know. Um, so, outside of that, I'm not a politician, you know. <laughs> Humanitarian and training, I like to say. Um, but, again, the arts, the entertainment is still vital. It's still important. And not everything is negative or whatever. It's, it's important to bring those folks together and to be that, that piece and to allow those outlets. I'm starting to see it more. Again, when I think after the... Uh, I think the Kunta Kinte Fest, I remember seeing out in the streets a lot of people performing, a lot of musicians playing, a lot of artists playing, or just out in the streets doing their thing. I would like to see a venue where that's more accepted here, where that's more welcomed here, more diverse, more of our culture here, where it's welcome and nobody's scared of losing something or something negative is going to happen. It's on our, us, our people as well to do, you know, our due diligence to make sure that doesn't happen as well. Um, but... In a positive light, I have seen the trajectory start to go and start to change. And um, I'm proud of that. I, I'm blessed to feel a part of that. And I don't want to, you know, feel like I had to keep creating rebel music, you know. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, my fourth and two cents on it for the most part. Um, there is a song or a verse, maybe, if I can recall it, <laughs> that I wrote and created maybe five, six, seven years ago. And I think it was an uprising around that time. But I feel like most of the lyrics are still um, relevant. It was based off a, um, I think an OJ song called To Get the People What They Want. I primarily um, wrote this verse as a, a part of what I like to call my artistic rehab, a, a mirror talk song, so whatever. I'm speaking on or saying, I don't want to make it feel like it's come across as preachy. It's, I'm speaking to myself in general. And a lot of us, sometimes my own people are reflected to myself anyways. So whatever I'm speaking on, I'm going to make sure that I'm actually doing it so that, you know, it's authentic and has authenticity to it. And I'm not just saying something. Um, the song called Give the People What They Want. And I think the first verse of that goes like this. Let me see if I recall. I'm tired of the same old, same old. Let's take matters into our own hands and change the game for better or worse. Or change this curse that hurts for every beaten with a soul wanting never to hold. The story remains the same. The rich rape the poor. In between peep the scenes from behind their doors. Nothing ever gets done. Still we remain the ones to hold the power to devour this corrupt kingdom. So stop watching the throne, grab a microphone, let our voice be heard, let the necessary occur. Operation infiltration set all across the nation. You know exactly what we face and so cease the hesitation. Time to occupy these streets to demand some action. We won't leave these grounds till they hear our sound. So when we're in town, this is how it's going down. Give us what we want and we're snatching your crown. You got to get the people. And I go on saying I got to get the people what they want. And I'm talking about giving them all of me to be that transparent leader and step up and be brave and somebody has to do it, you know, or the cycle is going to continue. Somebody has to, to step forward and kind of be that figure and be willing to do it. So when, you're, when it's time for you to exit this plane, you know, hopefully it'll just be a sigh of relief, you know, like I did what the best I could and it's okay. And it's not stuck in fear, oh, I got it, I can't, ah, it's just, all right, I'm good. And that's what I work towards every moment. And in the 2020s, I know that it's getting tougher out here with health issues and things going on. People are leaving us. So I am more focused personally to take care of my due diligence, my spiritual due diligence, and I hope everybody else does as well. So thank you, I love you guys, and uh, keep on doing what you're doing. All right, so we got a two for one. We got we got some 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 artistry, as well as some words. Uh, so thank you, Marcus. I uh, just want to reiterate. He said the arts brings people together, which I'm sure none of us can disagree with that, and that music makes you feel good, but also that we focus on respecting and appreciating culture and people's culture. Um, 
but he also touched on uh, the miseducation aspect, miseducation of the mind, miseducation of masses, miseducation of individuals, children, all of those things, communities. Um, and I'm, I'm just really excited about tonight, so I appreciate you all so much. Um, I want to do what I call a speed round. I think we're losing Alderman Gay. If you can hold on for one second, just in case there are. Um, are there any questions that anyone wants to pose to any of our panelists? Um, Phil? Cool. So I had uh, questions for two different uh, sections of the, of the evening. So um, from Ms. Coates, I'm just wondering what you're seeing in terms of um, making sure workers are paid and treated fairly and it's not an exploitative relationship with black business owners. And on the other side around worker rights, unionization, employee-owned companies, and worker co-ops in the black community. And uh, for Alderman Gay and uh, Delegate Henson, uh, any other elected officials in the room, um, Wondering what you're seeing or think will happen with political parties as far as new parties and existing parties with the decline in support and trust in both major parties as well as discussions of a move to nonpartisan elections here in Annapolis and also any thoughts so on how long term issues with our system affecting the black community such as gerrymandering voter suppression and campaign finance because of Citizens United uh, will affect the black community. So maybe it's because I have a limited <laughs> so, limited aptitude or something but uh, that was, a, that was a lot. Um, I, can, so I don't know, I'm, I don't know who, who caught what aspect of that, but uh, I only caught the very last. I can repeat whatever. I can always talk. <laughs> no, no, we, need, we need it for the, this. So this is another one of those here. Test, test, okay. Um, as far as workers pay, about, I've lost two years of my life. Um, about two years ago, I was invited to a roundtable on the whole conversation around uh, minimum wage. And from a banking aspect at that time, it was interesting because we were really concerned that we had, if, we, if we'd gone to a $15 per hour as a minimum wage, there would often be households in which teenagers were making more than their parents. And in some of our households, it was a bigger concern that that teenager may be the only working person in the household. And how ironic would it be if this person is making more money than a parent that's not working, and then it impacted their social services. Turn around four years later, and there's a pandemic, and they're saying that there is a worker shortage. Well, the reality of some of that is people have not gone unemployed, they become reemployed in environments and in industries that are paying more of a living wage than a minimum wage. And a lot of these companies have got to get to the point where they take, they get more risk in running their business, which means they take less profit and they share their wealth with the people that actually made them rich. Um, so some of that will be a government issue for a while. But a lot of that just speaks to what the industry is saying, that I can make more money self-employed and get my benefits from the government than work at a job where I'm not valued. That answers the question. It touched on it, but maybe we can talk after. OK, I so I want to I want to thank you for being for trying to for trying to uh, speed that along, because I know it's really hard to get to it. So as each of you answer, I know it's a pain, but if you could make it uh, succinct. So do you have the question that you want to direct towards um, sure. the delegate and the alder person? Sure. Um, so uh, just what, what are you seeing or think will happen with political parties as far as new parties and existing parties uh, with decline in support and trust in both major parties as well as discussions of a move to nonpartisan elections here in Annapolis? And also if you have any thoughts on how long-term issues with our system affecting black community such as gerrymandering, voter suppression, and campaign finance uh, because of Citizens United. So there is a chairwoman in the House of Delegates, Chairwoman Pendergrass. Just go back a little bit, Chairwoman Pendergrass. And what she says is, your question cannot be longer than the answer. So 
that means I at least get as long as the question. Um, but uh, to the first part of your question about gerrymandering, we just went through a really important process in the state, and I'm sure Alderman Gabe will talk about it on the city level as well. And that's that after the census that we do every 10 years, we have had to redraw our district boundaries. When you look at a city like Baltimore, which is losing population, but traditionally has elected black elected officials, elected progressive elected officials, and you see the population dwindling, the temptation is to take districts away and to dilute the power of the voice in Baltimore City. But what we have the power to do is to make sure that through the lines and the boundaries that we draw, we not only respect one voice, one vote, but we also respect the diversity that we're capable of as a state. So I do think that when we look at the maps that we've drawn, we've tried to be very intentional about what the composition of the 188 members of the General Assembly will look like, will sound like, the values that they will reflect based on the diversity of our state. When we look at the uh, party system that we have for elections, I always tell people, being a minority, I appreciate being a part of a political party because it gives me the power to amplify my voice. If we are only 30% of the state, we don't have to be only 30% of the decision makers and 30% of what is relevant in terms of political conversation. We have the ability to take our small minority and to make it a part of a larger majority and to advocate for our issues to be heard. So I think there is value in party politics. I think that as if with anything that, you know, too much of anything, anything that's unchecked and unfettered is no longer effective or functional. So the inclusion of third parties, the inclusion of independent voters is something that we have to continue to value and continue to uplift in the state of Maryland because it makes all parties better when we understand and embrace the diversity. Thanks, Phil. I love political questions because it also shows that um, we are not monolithic as a people uh, because while I respect my uh, colleague, we have just slightly different um, answers as it relates to that. Um, I well, I'll start with the uh, the uh, as it relates to the uh, policy, the, the party question you asked. Um, I mentioned that I am a firm believer in the inception and, and creation of democracy, and so I don't think there's a problem with the political system. I think there is a problem with the people running the political system. I think democracy is set to work in a way that engages both the elected and the electoral. Um, and so will there be third parties that eventually um, you know, engage in the political process to the point where it actually makes a difference? At some point, I'm sure there will, but uh, to be quite honest, right now, I don't fear that there will be any threat to the two-party system. Um, as it relates to nonpartisan elections, which has been brought up a lot um, uh, before the city council here in Annapolis, I really haven't made up my mind on that yet because it doesn't make sense to me. If I'm knocking at your door in a uh, partisan or nonpartisan election, I'm going to tell you my beliefs and what I stand for. Based off of that dialogue, you'll be able to tell if I'm a Republican or a Democrat. So the only difference in a nonpartisan election is that I don't have a D or an R next to my name. There have been talks, as you mentioned, the campaign financing that along with the nonpartisan uh, elections can bring a, a, an option of public financing to make sure that more candidates are engaged in the process. I like that idea because I do think we need to broaden the... Um, uh, the pool of candidates and so there's always room to tweak uh, the electoral process but in short no I don't think that the two-party system is uh, under threat and I really don't think that a nonpartisan election would have any significant um, difference on turnout uh, or financing of political elections do you I think one other thing before you put the mic down is um thought I heard you say something about gerrymandering and redistricting. Yeah, yeah you're right. Actually, right. yeah. And I think so, yeah, yeah. To, as the delegate mentioned, the state is during their process right now, and the city is uh, actively uh, in the process of redistricting. Tomorrow night, actually, at um, 
I'll say 6.30 for safety because I think it starts at 7, maybe all the 7 o'clock? Okay, yeah, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at Pitt Moria Rec uh, Center, uh, the public will have an opportunity to weigh in on the three maps that the redistricting commission has put forward. Um, and because this is an event for so focused around black history, I'll talk about the issues critical to the black wards. The issue that it's boiled down to right now is, uh, do, in particularly for the ward that I represent in the sixth ward, um, do we keep Robinwood and Bay Ridge Gardens? And there are two responses to that, I think. And there are, you have to look at it through two lenses. My first thought is, obviously, I would like to keep Robinwood as we're approaching a critical redevelopment um, uh, process as it relates to HACA. The uh, delegate, the state has done a fantastic job at supporting us. Obviously, the Choice Neighborhood Grant is for Eastport, but I'm a firm believer that if that goes successful, there will be opportunities for Robinwood. And I would like to be um, able to see those projects through because I think it's important that you know, we've built up and we've had such great dialogue as it relates to that, we've got to get to the finish line. The second is, do we get rid of uh, R Bay Ridge Gardens, uh, which is also known as Annapolis Woods? I am more likely to side with a version of the map. If you, and, and, and look here, at, you have to look at the maps and also understand my dialogue here. I'm more likely to side with a map that would give Bay Ridge Gardens to Ward 7. And here's why. I think that as the only person on the council right now, and this is obviously considering that Newtown 20 is demolished, and so a majority of the public housing residents are now within Ward 6. As the only person that represents public housing communities, excluding subsidized housing, I know Annapolis Gardens is subsidized, it is a hassle. It is a very, very tough job. I had a call from a constituent a week ago at 5.17 a.m. because a toilet fell through the ceiling. It's always something going on. And when you come to the table with just one of, you know, a, a, necess need, a needed five votes, it is extremely difficult to get support. We need, as we discussed here, to either A, elect people that think like us and agree that those issues are of, 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 of importance and concerns, or two, let our other colleagues who don't realize what is actually taking place into these communities step into the role of representing them. And that's where I believe the uh, uh, swap to uh, Ward 7 for Bay Ridge Gardens uh, you know, would be helpful. Obviously, this is very, very new here. Public testimony, like I said, is tomorrow. So don't take my word here for, uh, my word here for tonight. Get engaged, follow the process, be vocal, um, and, and try to support a map. That's, that's just my stance on that. I, I think we've done a really good job of fixing the uh, gerrymandering from a decade ago. So where does that information live if people want to? So um, you can email me at aldgay at annapolis.gov, and I'll forward you uh, the link for public testimony. Uh, but also, as I stated, it's important to show up tomorrow night 7 o'clock, Pitmore Recreation Center, um, to just be vocal and, and also to just get informed about what's taking place is so important on a local level, not to just credit the state's work, but because there are some significant changes there too. But on this local level, it really you know, makes a difference in who represents us. So, yeah. All right, thank you so much. And uh, Phil, I don't, I don't know if you're finished, but I want to plug something else um, for Black, for. Um, the MLK Parade and Diaspora uh, is April 2nd, and that'll be taking place. Um, the center of that will be downtown around the city dock. So spread the word. Um, obviously, it's incredibly important for us at, when we talk about culture and cultural events that further um, exemplify the African-American, the black experience. Um, uh, that is one. Um, was there anything else that you had? And thank you, because no, you shouldn't feel bad about that. That was a lot of really good stuff. And, and, and thank you for that. I, I, thank you. I know, I know. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, again, I'm going to channel Tola a little bit. I was out sick when we kind of planned this, when he planned this, so I don't want to overstep. But I think 
we should do this again, and we don't have to do it just in Black History Month. I think this is powerful. I'd also like to see the same done, thing done, I think, for our, uh, our Latino um, community as well, because this is, this is completely awesome. Um, last but not least, certainly not least, we are going to hear from our esteemed older woman, Rhonda Pendel Charles, um, who is um, a, an advocate for everything that, that's important to me, and I can speak on behalf of Tola, Erica, all of us, right, like in this room, that she has been um, an example of policy making that really considers the heart of, of constituents and considers where people are, not where we want them to be, but meeting them where you are, you know, where they are, and joining, you know, joining with them on delivering resources and showing up. I don't know if you all remember when we had a tornado um, that came through Annapolis, um, and I know that was a state of emergency, but we had several policymakers who were on the ground and made sure things got done. Um, and we have, in, you know, in this room, we have people who, who were there and, and moved the needle and provided resources to those people. So I want to thank you on behalf of those people who are your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. The state of Black Annapolis, past, present, and future, economics, education, elections, entertainment. The days of our lives. Good evening. Some of you may remember the snow blizzard of 1966. My mother, who was a teacher, decided that since we had a week off from school that we should start to make a quilt. We started with finding some really old fabric remnants that my grandmother had from the past. Later, to add to the quilt, we needed to find some fabric pieces that we currently had but were no longer needed for its original purpose, pieces that we had presently. And the final quilt consisted of fabric strips that we had to purchase later at the fabric store that would fill in the center and around the edges of the quilt that we had to purchase in the future. And I still have that quilt today. Once a quilt is finished, it represents a wonderful tapestry of colors, sizes, textures, and weight. And what you end up with is a very beautiful and useful product that can last up to, yes, over 55 years. As such, we can take a critical eye to the state of Black Annapolis, past, present, and future, economics, education, elections, entertainment, by being reminded of this quilt comparison. The old fabric remnants from the past, the stories from our past, start us on our journey and they help us to understand the road ahead. The fabric pieces that we need to use currently, today, keep us focused on what our needs are today and what resources are available today to fill those needs, possibly those resources that are no longer needed for our original purpose, but are useful today. And we can look to the future, those fabric strips that fill in the center and around the edges, those resources for our needs in the future. Starting back in the 1950s especially, and even up until today, the daytime soap operas have been watched by millions of TV viewers. So we can use this part of our past to show us the way today and tomorrow. So let us begin quilting away. Additionally, we have also heard over these past three weeks inspiration from music, narrations, and questions and answers. These threads holding our fabric together that complete our quilt. First, of course, we heard from the past, from Janice Hayes Williams, who always focuses us to focus, forces us to focus on economics. Many of our ancestors' wide-ranging and quilted entrepreneurial spirit where there were no good government jobs for us here. And we cannot overlook one of Janice's true favorites and quoting her, this is my guy, the debonair Mr. Smith Price, who, as we recall, one of the old soap operas could have been Janice's love of life. Yes, Janice, you represent the bold and the beautiful. From yours truly, for too many of us, when it came to education, with the painful, clinically traumatic, and tumultuous days of the past, where we were truly in another world, these experiences continue to haunt our community to this very day. Nevertheless, for me, while I never watched the soap opera Port Charles, nevertheless, I found Mr. Charles at Morgan State University, so in the end, this HBCU served me very well. From Carl Snowden reiterating his quilted recollections, recollections of our past elections and politics, from the White House to the names of Annapolis's streets, 
to the indiscretions of former presidents, including Thomas Jefferson, to the history of the progressive African-American Republicans in our city, to the gradual reduction of the African-American population in our city today, to Alderman Wally H. Bates, all which point to the fact that politics and elections affect everything. Some were loving, too much loving, in fact, and some carried around dark shadows. From Vincent Legas, taking us back in time to fun, frolic family and friends and entertainment as we lounged at Cars and Sparrows Beaches in Annapolis, where two African-American female businesswomen had the opportunity to exhibit and to quilt together empowerment and confidence during a time when we could forget about the white only and colored only signs and the humiliation of it all. Where the Green Book was not an environmental bestseller and where we could hear over the airwaves tonight, 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 which came from the voice of a man who was definitely not stuttering. Yes, we felt like we only had one life to live and where at the time, love is a many splendor thing. Second, of course, we heard from the present, from Shelton Willett, an area businessman who slowly and methodically and without hesitation followed the road less traveled when it comes to economics, a road where he was told would have many bumps along the way. Nevertheless, he stuck with his plan and started on his quilt. He outlined to us his five years of studying how he could implement his plan here in Annapolis. He did his homework. And so now in his words, these are exciting times where he initially embraced Messieurs Carol Henson, Will Rao, and Anatoly Jai, his elder and his peers, and then indicating that we now have access to government to capital business plans. In his words, people are more generous than you think, and the mayor and the city council are great. So no, it wasn't the soap opera's Ryan's hope, but it was Shelton's hope and faith that led him not to be on Peyton Place, but to now today to be on Main Street. From Naya Curtis, a lifelong Annapolitan and a 30-year-old young woman who founded her own business, Eye Opening Photography and where she used some extremely powerful words to describe our present elections. These are her three very eye-opening words, suppression, hope, progression. But she also used these words, prevention, restraint, expectations, desires, process, restrictions, forceful acts, joy, disappointment. These words wrap around Naya's quilt of voting and your voice. And we were all inspired when in 2008, Barack Obama was elected our president of the free world. We are very glad that Naya is a lifelong Annapolitan. No, thank goodness, Naya is not a resident of the fictional soap opera town of Santa Barbara. Naya's bold and passionate descriptions and presentation is a prescription that goes way beyond any prescription that could be written on the soap opera, The Doctors. From Pastor Cheryl, whose work is not necessarily newsworthy, nor will it be advertised on any large and lighted billboard, but she and her team's work have been unequivocally impactful when it comes to education. For over 38 years, they have been on the road working on the quilt. They work passionately with our schools, county, and city. This work has uncovered the unthinkable impact of COVID-19, namely that our African-American children are now academically behind 12 months. What makes this worse is that they were already behind academically 12 months. Poverty has impacted these unfortunate statistics. Pastor Cheryl has thrust herself into studying adverse childhood experiences, the ACEs, and the wide-ranging studies produced by Kaiser Permanente. Pastor Cheryl continues to testify and testify and persevere and to be as passionate of an advocate as she can be. And she knows a thing or two about being on the edge of night as well as in the throes of the secret storm. But that never holds down Pastor Cheryl Menendez. From Carol Henson, who took us down the quilted memory lane of music with his rapid and staccato listening of the greats in entertainment that he has been associated with over the past 40 years, namely Chuck Brown and the Soul Searchers, the Go-Go Craze in DC, Cars Beach, Clover's Inn, the Van Dykes, the XBD, Star Point with the lead female vocalist Renee Diggs, my high school classmate, the influence of our local church music, the Brown family, Art Sherrod, Ron Ward, and most recently, the influence of our Kunta Kente festivals and Juneteenth on our city music scene. 
And so he asks and states, what's going on? And it's a shame. We are squished in between Baltimore and DC, which makes our music opportunity, our city music opportunities almost nil. But let us not forget over the past eight years, the Chambers Park Summer Concert Series, where local and homegrown musical groups, especially from parole, are in their glory. Carol's most memorable words as we ponder how we should proceed next. I love music. It is our decision. Let's make it happen here in Annapolis. Third, of course, tonight we hear from the future. Tonight we have heard from Michelle Coates when it comes to economics and where she possesses the traits of a banker extraordinaire. Education. Everyone should read books. Normalize trade in tech schools. Consider the military. Share with family. There's value in hard work. Use complimentary words. Work toward generational wealth. Support black businesses. Save consistently. Make a will. Get life insurance. We must save ourselves. And as Michelle continues to teach us about working toward the quilt of healthy financial living, so we won't end up in the general hospital of poverty. And we've heard from Stacey King and her genuine and noted passion for education. I knew Miss Helen Turner, and I know her. She was excellent at Annapolis High School. Stress abounds, and then the pandemic, which exposed inequalities. Voting allows for choices. It determines the future of education. Educational statistics in the womb, and it starts in the womb. Singing, school elevates all. Be engaged. Learn what you, well that, learn what your child is exposed to learn. Learn the strategies. African American contributions to society in Annapolis are very important. Internships are extraordinarily important. This all lends to hope. And she, Stacy, is truly the guiding light that quilt that we should all follow in support of our children, families, and community. And from my city council colleagues in arms, Alderman Dewan Gay and former Alderwoman Shanika Henson, now our state delegate, ever, both ever vocal, always moving, and forever in the mix. They are truly a quilt of many dimensions. I can say this, that their heart is definitely in the right places. We've heard from Delegate Henson, there's much work to do about it our circuit court, who shows up? Let's look at our incarceration rate, look at home ownership. The HBCU's lawsuit was finally settled. Look at police betterment, appraisal gap, that's important. Legislative Black Caucus, we have the largest in Maryland. Let's remain hopeful. And Alderman Gay, he is grateful for the opportunities. He seen, he's, democracy is important, power to the people, words, with actions, we better vote. Let's pay attention. Voice and actions combined. Look at civic engagement. That's the heart of everything. We need to show up. We need to follow through. We need to follow Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We need to speak out. We are ready. We have ourselves. Stay true and have faith. Yes, they can be categorized as the young and the restless. They are truly one of all my children. And finally, as we close out this series, we heard from none other than Marcus Hayes, prolific songwriter and performing artist and a student of the arts. Feeling good. Foreign countries, he's had many experiences. We have too many divisions here, few outlets. He's met, formed many partnerships. Let's be respectful of those who appreciate various cultures. He had to fight, and we have to fight for good. There are miseducation going on. Let's circulate and invest our money. Year-round discussions on history are needed. More of our culture is needed. Give the people what they want. Love all people. The trajectory is changed and is going upward. We have spiritual and must do spiritual due diligence. When it comes to entertainment, Marcus can hit all of the right notes, quilting away as we continue to search for tomorrow. So as the world turns, and we continue our quilting, and while we finally ponder the state of Black Annapolis, past, present, and future, economics, education, elections, entertainment, let us continually remember that these are indeed the days of our lives. Thank you, and God bless you all. Marcus, you might have a run for your money. That was... That was that was extremely well written. That was, that was good. Yeah, that was really good. So we want to close out. And um, I want to 
thank you all on behalf of um, Atatola and behalf of the mayor and behalf of um, Erica and um, anyone who takes ownership of this, which it is all of ours, um, I, I'm overwhelmed. Um, and we must do it again. So before you, I keep doing this to Duong, but um, the, thing, the thing that I, that I preempted, and we're going to leave with this, I promise I will say no more. But what we did last time is we need to look to the future. And I want you in one, this is the challenge, one or two words. So for all of our panelists, one or two words as we look to the future. OK? And let's begin with Stacy. Well, we need them on mic. <laughs> One or two words. That's, that's what makes it so hard. May I have your attention, please? It is now 8.45, and the library will be closing promptly. I get those. Those are the words right there, right? OK, but, but real quick, real quick, because we don't follow rules all the time. Oh. Oh. The computers will be turning off automatically at 8.55 p.m. Save. S-A-V-E. Save. Get involved. Oh, there you go. What was the question? Um, look into the future. One or two words. Um, um, I don't know. But prosperity and... Um, I will mix two, hopefully economic and academic success. <laughs> Rule breaker. Um, Marcus. Oh, I oh, my gosh, two words, what? One or two words, look into the future. What would you leave us with? Um, courageous love. Love. And for the man of the hour, I'll let him give us, give us a word or two. More love. <laughs> All right, peace and love, everyone. Everyone get home safely.